Carlos Nelson with the Kansas City Business Association and this is a continuation of our series on uh, people that are running for elected office here in Kansas City. Who do we have here? I'm Dr. Marvia Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, who you are, uh, how long you've been in Kansas City, uh, you got the big doctor behind your name what what what's that about right yeah so originally i am from jacksonville florida um i went to undergrad in tallahassee florida i met my husband uh down there he's a kansas city native but uh he decided to come down south and uh we met in tallahassee a couple years after we got married we moved up here who was your degree in yeah, yeah. Undergraduate uh, was in chemical science. Oh, yeah. all right. And go tell them a little bit about it. How you rise to <laughs> getting that PhD. Yeah, so um, I attended Kent University of Kansas once we moved up here, and my I pursued a joint degree program in public health and community psychology, behavioral psychology. Mm -hmm. So my PhD is in behavioral psychology. All right, all right. T tell our audience. Why do you think uh, you want them to vote for you mm -hmm. uh, for uh, that position on the school board? Yeah, so I have been invested since day one we moved here. Uh, we made a jointly conscious decision to invest in our neighborhood. We wanted specifically to move into the urban core. Um, even as some people say, people have choices about where you can move. But Bernard Powell said, get all gold mine, the choice is yours. Exactly, all exactly. Right. And um, I, even though I didn't necessarily grow up in that time period, whenever I read books, I hear about how you would have doctors and lawyers on the same block as the people. As school teachers, as the trash man. Absolutely. Uh, our neighborhoods were together. Absolutely. Uh, I, I moved here in 78 and I moved over in Sheridan Estates. That was like supposed to be your first or one of the first all black neighborhoods. And we had all kinds of professionals and we had working people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was that village that they talk about. Absolutely. And uh, they would have Pequeno parties, Monopoly parties, and different neighbors would come by, but we've lost that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I didn't want to be a part of the movement away from our urban neighborhoods. And so I'm happy to say that uh, I've been an active member of my neighborhood association, Blue Hills Neighborhood Association. We're doing neighborhood cleanups, even an unorganized cleanups. Do you have kids? I do. I have Tell our audience a little bit about that. They have need two, to know. Two children, and this is really interesting. When we when we first when we had started having children, is when the conversation really started. Okay, you guys got to leave now. Mm -hmm. It's time for you to leave now because the school district is supposedly having a lot of challenges. So you need to leave. Um, but we have two children. There are six. Uh, he's almost seven, and I have a four-year-old as well, both boys, uh, and we've been having a great experience in, in our children's school. Mm -hmm. All right, tell me this. Do you, what, do you have a, a plan, different candidates? Tell our mm -hmm. audience. What, tell, tell us about your plan. Yeah, so my plan, so coming from a perspective of public health and psychology, I believe that we have uh, a lot of challenges right now with our children who are coming into the school district, experiencing trauma, instability, different challenges that we just, and then we expect them to just sit at the desk and perform. Um, and right now we have not funded well enough, in my opinion, the supports that should wrap around those students. So I'm focusing on beefing up our support for uh, opportunities to teach them healthy coping strategies. So we talk about the high eviction rate in this city, mm -hmm. um, how thousands of families being evicted every year. Well, those children come to school. Um, and so if you can imagine the trauma that you feel not knowing if you're going to come home and find your stuff out on the street. I've, I've dealt with kids like that. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's switch gears. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on this uh, kindergarten issue? The pre-K, mayor's right. pre-K tax plan. Right. So as someone with two young children, I wish that I could wholeheartedly support um, anything that would be aiming to provide universal pre-K. Uh, Pre-K is extremely important. All the research says that the earlier you get education, the better your outcomes will be as you progress through your grades. However, uh, as it stands, I cannot support the mayor's tax plan uh, for pre-K right now. Um, there are many reasons to not support it. Uh, for me, it's about equity of causing the people who can least afford uh, 
the cost to bear the burden. So they are most in need of pre-K, but can least afford it, and they are bearing a disproportionate with that tax of the, cost of the tax. Yeah. All right. Uh, <clears throat> is there anything specifically that you think our audience should know about you? Yeah. So I. Um, one of the things that people have mentioned is that, uh, so per, for instance, opponents have said, well, they are um, very experienced, 30-something years, and I'm unconvinced that uh, just having sunk or sunk in 30 years into something uh, is all that it takes. So as someone who is on the younger side, but I have consulted at the national level with the Center for Disease Control, I am still a consultant. All right, this is what I would say. Uh, <clears throat> tell, tell our audience a few of your accomplishments yeah. coming up the yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. So uh, at the local level, um, someone who was active in the neighborhood, serving as a block contact and, you know, working just for neighbors, then escalating to working for the state. One of the things that I've done with for the state of uh, Kansas and Missouri is to serve on a blue ribbon panel where we were looking at how to reduce infant mortality. So my work is not only local, it's at the state level as well as the national level. So right now, uh, the Center for Disease, Con Disease Control, as you know, has been uh, trying to work on opioid addiction. Um, so not only have I served- but, but, okay. You mentioned that, hold okay. I'm Let's interrupting go. you on, on that. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Uh, because again, we're on the Kansas City Business Association show. As mm -hmm. most of our viewers know, I'm right. concerned about the African-American community. And when that opioid, uh, epidemic, as mm -hmm. they're calling it now, yeah. has been existing in, in the African-American community for basically two decades, and they dealt with that in incarceration as you being in the mental health mm -hmm. field. Do you have any, and, and now it's uh, a mental health issue. Right. How, right. how do you feel about that? Right. One of the things I've been focusing on, Mr. Nelson, is that um, with this new emphasis on epidemic and it's now a health problem, it's a health concern, it's not a moral failing, with that uh, for the majority culture, has what has come with that is change our changes in laws. And so uh, one of the things, so for instance, I'll give you an example. For instance, uh, it used to be that if your baby had uh, drugs in their system when they were born, um, your baby would more or less be taken from you at birth. Um, but with this new emphasis, now that the demographics have changed quite a bit, now we have laws that say, no, if the mother has sort of said, hey, I need help, uh, I, sh I shouldn't be sent to jail for this. So not, not only will she not go to jail, she will be supported to keep her baby with yeah. her. Support and so, system. So my, my thing is, hey, I, it's a big problem that the black community in the past was not afforded this opportunity. But now that the law has changed, let's we need to be aware of those changes and we need to leverage them as well. So whatever program these uh, uh, other people are using in order to capitalize on the, the new, softer way of dealing right. with drug addiction. It's just like with the, uh, <laughs> how they did with the crack. Uh, versus right. the methamphetamines. Exactly. It was a whole different... Uh, they wanted to put you away. Now when they got in their community, it becomes a health issue and and, and there's all kinds of supportive services. Uh, yeah. Tell me this. Do you think that uh, from an educational point of view, and we talked off camera uh, mm -hmm. about our coach association and mental health mm -hmm. for our kids, how do you see uh, that in the district per se? Uh, has, do you think that uh, the mental health of our kids oh, yeah. uh, are being mm -hmm. uh, addressed adequately? Right. So, and I, I tr th thank you for the question. I, I'm always trying to be sensitive because you never want to paint a whole community as right. they all have mental problems. Um, that's never what I want to say because that's stigmatizing in and of itself. However, uh, we do know that when you've had uh, systemic, historic um, oppression of a community. Um, the community has continuously been shut out of opportunities such as economic development, jobs, access to I quality. I like that, education. economics. Yeah. yeah, when you've been shut out, you do struggle under a different set of uh, challenges than other people do. So the evictions and the violence that's happening in our neighborhoods, uh, those things children bring with them into our schools. And we, as the as the grown-ups in the room, we need to put better support services around them. All right. Switching gears, <clears throat> do you think that our community and the school district in, in general uh, has used the tools and uh, the uh, 
digital networks that are available to transmit information that is uh, sorely needed in our community and, and in our overall community. Do you think the leadership have really connected to the grassroots? I think that, um, so when I think specifically about Dr. Bedell, I'm going to speak from that standpoint because right. my children are in the KCPS right. district. Like that. Uh, so I think that he has done a, a great job of reaching out to the community, showing up at small meetings. He was at my uh, Blue Hills neighborhood meeting a few weeks ago. Mm. You know, we had the superintendent at our neighborhood meeting. That mm. speaks a lot. Where I think that we could do better is by finding other forms of media uh, to reach out to the community. So, you know, doing more frequent, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be long interviews or long talks, but finding ways of meeting people. Where All right, I'm switching to economics. <coughs> uh, Excuse me. Do you feel that the Kansas City School Board is doing, uh, and you might not even know this, mm -hmm. uh, the administration uh, is doing enough on the economic side to do business with African-American businesses. And I had this discussion with um, Melissa Robinson when she was on the show. Uh, I don't do business with them primarily, and uh, this MBE status mm -hmm. uh, would have you. I'm like, why do I have to fill out something to be MBE? The majority community, you don't have to say they the majority community. Mm -hmm. Why do the, these impediments uh, exists for African American. That that's what they are. Af they're, they're impediments, and I want to know how you feel about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel that equal access to business opportunities is going to be important for us. So whether the business is media or mm -hmm. supplying or services, mm -hmm. I think that we definitely need to make sure we have strong outreach to those businesses, make them feel welcomed and encouraged to pursue contracts or what have you in the district. All right, that's. Uh, in closing, do you have any final words and how can our community contact you mm -hmm. uh, and donate to your campaign if they want to? Okay, so the first, you know, we can, I can be reached at Marvia for KCPS on Facebook. Uh, again, that's M A R V I A for KCPS. Remember, I am a write in candidate for Sub District 4. Uh, you can find more information about me there. I do respond to messages, so I would be happy to, to hear from you. Um, I would say in closing, I would like for everyone to do our research. Do your research on who is running for the office. And Google is free. Uh, do a free, you can do your free background check just by Googling each of our names. And I just would encourage people to not go with the status quo and not believe that just because a name has been thrown around a long time that that's the best choice. I want us to be informed. I believe that that is what is going to help our communities by each of us being independently informed about the people that we are bringing in to represent us. I, I, I totally concur with every last word you said. Uh, to our public, you have got to know who you're voting for and what they stand for. Last question, how do you feel integrity plays and honesty plays in our elected officials? Oh, that's huge for me. That's huge for me. When you cast your vote for someone, some people are going canvassing and doing not you support a, cam uh, uh, a candidate. You are saying, I trust that you're going to represent me and you're going to keep my best interests in your, in mm -hmm. your forefront. For and when someone violates that by being underhanded in any way or going with different motives, you are weakening our trust in democracy. And we, as, especially as, as, as a black community, we have seen enough of that uh, and it has harmed us. And so I think that integrity is impor absolutely important. Integrity, ethics, and honesty. Excellent. And closing, <laughs> as always... When you invest in your community, you're really just investing in yourself. Absolutely. Good night. This program is brought to you by the Kansas City Business Association.